in our coast unit of work and in today's lesson you should be able to define what the coast is what the littoral zone is and what the um, various parts of the littoral zone are and why to some extent the UK has a variety of features and landscapes around the coast and you should also be able to uh, list inputs outputs and processes at the coast make sure that before you continue watching this video you pause it and you uh, write down the key terms in the purple box here geology littoral zone hydrological cycle concordant discordant terrestrial if you can't define those terms by the end of this lesson you need to do some research in a textbook or in some of the resources that are available to you that I have provided. Before we um, get going on coast I just want you to have a think about how you are nine months away from your A level and the top picture here shows how uh, you think it might go, I guess that's your plan, there's your goal at the end, there's a checkered flag from Formula One and you're going on your merry way towards your excellent A-levels and uh, you're thinking about um, this sort of straight path but the actual reality is more like the bottom picture where you have good sections uh, and dip some bad sections and uh, I would describe the last six months of your school career as one big uh, chalk pit that you um, unfortunately had to go into so uh, through no fault of your own of course because of the pandemic and uh, but the reality is the outcome will be the same or perhaps even better as long as you accept that kind of uh, process as bits that go well and bits that don't go as well. This is just a little um, slide on um, the sort of Vespa kind of approach to learning and the most interesting thing about this, I guess, is that um, many students who uh, don't perform as well at A-level as they uh, want to actually are under the impression that they put quite a lot of effort in, whereas when surveys are done among students who um, actually do gain high grades, that, that students that achieve lower grades are very surprised with how many hours of independent work um, high achieving candidates do. So. If you want to do well in your Geography A-level, you should be mindful of the fact that you need to put in between four and six hours of independent work a week. And for this course, um, this half term, you will be doing your listening to the content will be done at home with a revision question from a different topic that isn't coast. And that will that will make up a few hours of your own time. If you come into lessons without being prepared by listening to these lectures, then you will find the classwork exceedingly difficult. So the first thing I want you to do, now we're getting onto the coast um, work, is I want you to pause the video at this point and just scribble down your definition of what you think coast is. So just pause the video now. And if you've um, got your definition there in front of you on a bit of paper, you can see in the top right hand box here that this is one definition of the coast, possibly one you should note down now by pausing the video and um, making sure that you learn that key term as occasionally you do get a two marker which will ask you to define it. Um, another definition I've heard is one where that part of the land which meets the sea and that part of the sea which meets the land which also uh, you know, basically is the same thing as this definition here. You should be aware that the coastal zone is a, a, a basically a system and it's a dynamic system with inputs and outputs and processes like the um, like a drainage basin like the water cycle but the coastal zone is not a closed system it is an open system and it's dynamic dynamic means it, it constantly changing constantly moving and uh, you'll see as we go through these slides what some of those uh, movements are and this is Basically, this, this box here is showing you that there uh, at the coast there is a, a backshore, foreshore, and there's nearshore and offshore, and that basically defines a littoral zone, which we'll come to in a later slide. So if coasts are can considered to be systems uh, which are open, therefore they are uh, prone to, or the part of the system involves inputs, processes, and outputs. And what we need to do here is pause the video and make three headings that say inputs, processes and outputs 
and list as many as you can think of. You'll see at the bottom of this slide that there are a few uh, suggestions here, which you, if you're stuck, which you might want to put into the correct boxes. Uh, think of as many as you can, and then when you're ready, unpause the video and you'll see the full list. So this slide shows all the inputs, processes and outputs of um, the coastal system. There are others, this is kind of not a definitive list, but basically um, you need to make sure that you've got all these things under your headings if you haven't got them all by yourself already. So if you've got, for example, in the processes box, um, if you've, instead of erosion, if you've written um, abrasion or something like that, that's actually fine because that's just one type of erosion, isn't it? So be sensible about your list. Um, often the examiner likes to present the candidate with um, a system diagram like this and ask you to sort of comment on processes. Um, inputs people usually are very find really quite easy to get their head round. Um, sometimes people confuse processes and outputs. So have a little think that you understand what the difference between them is. So um, a, a process is basically something that's happening. So if you just think erosion, deposition and transportation you'll be fine. So when you think of the coast, and we've got that definition in an earlier slide, think about um, how important the coast is and you might want to pause the video and just quickly Google what percentage of people actually live by the coast in the world. And it's, uh, it's basically the most populated part of the continental shelf that, um, that humans live on. So more humans live by the coast than live anywhere else, especially in countries like Australia, where it's very hot in the interior. And uh, obviously not in landlocked countries, clearly. They don't live by the coast, do they? But there aren't that many of those. So if you think about all the uses we've got of the coast here, um, hopefully you realise that we've got sort of fishing there, we've got leisure, we've got two forms of leisure there, we've got people living by the coast, and there's a picture of uh, a port with all the containers top right there. And uh, the geography word that we use for um, people that... Um, are using something we call them players but you know that already from 6.1 geography and it's important also to note that one of the inputs to the coast um, is um, is a humans basically because we cause enormous changes at the coast with um, either positively or negative so you can think about us putting in um, uh, what do you call them coastal controls such as seawalls etc um, but you need to sort of think wider than that and think about if you dredge a river to make it deeper for shipping, so you've got a channel that's deeper, that will affect the coast because obviously the river feeds some of its sediment to the coast and rivers generally more, nine times out of ten end at an ocean or a sea. Uh, we might dredge an offshore area to get sand and gravel for construction. We might dredge an offshore area to do beach reclamation by putting sand back on a beach. For leisure purposes and we build things on the coast we build houses we build defenses uh, we build defenses to defend against the sea we build defenses to um, stop our houses falling in the sea we build defenses to stop flooding and all these things have an impact further down the coast or at the actual place where um, these things happen and we'll be looking at some of the impacts of humans um, at the coast in inquiry question form we look at climate change and when we look at um, flooding and how humans have, to, to some extent, caused all of that. So if we think about the coast as a dynamic landscape, remember earlier I said that dynamic, what meant that it was always moving, it's never the same. You go to a beach one day, a storm occurs overnight, and you go to a beach the next day, it looks completely different. This is uh, more than, to some extent, any other landscape. The coast is always changing, so it's exceedingly uh, dynamic landscape and here you, you can see a more complicated version of the um, process model with inputs processes and outputs of the coast as a system you can see here that there are there are a lot more um, things on the diagram so you could pause the video here and you could add some more things to your list of three processes outputs and inputs which would be a good thing to do and um, there are probably some examples of changes and impacts that you can think of that aren't listed on this diagram. So we've thought of three already. And you might want to think about how else water can enter the coastal system. So we've got 
rain entering the coastal system obviously if it rains if there's a big storm these rivers that are obviously water entering the coastal system and then we could think about snow things like that so that we could think about humans um putting drainage pipes from their towns and villages it that come out at the coast so there's lots of other ways that water basically acts upon the coast so we've talked about this dynamic equilibrium at the coastal system and i'd like you to pause the video at this point and take a look at this exam question here so suggest how changes to one part of the coastal system causes change in another and this is a four mark question so if you're not sure, you're going to answer this question in a minute when you pause the video. If you are not sure how to um, answer this question after what you've been listening to and looking at, then you need to go back to the, um, the model of the coast with inputs, processes and outputs. So thinking about maybe a couple of examples about how changes to one part of the coastal system causes a change in another. So pause the video at this point and take four or five minutes maximum to write down a quick answer to this question. Okay, welcome back. So here is um, an exemplar answer with the points scored in red. And obviously the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that this candidate has scored five points. This is because they've over-egged the pudding. But the, the point is I marked every time the candidate in this this case me I was the candidate and the examiner and um, said something that was worthy of a mark so the case is a dynamic system one mark for that so change in one part affects other parts yep lovely two for example a higher rate of erosion due to a storm event might be followed by increased deposition down coast another point good old me this puts more material on the beach which subsequently slows down the rate of erosion as the extra material on the beach absorbs the wave energy and protects the coastline and there's another mark and just because i wanted to go a star on it obviously you realize that you can't get five marks on a four mark question but just in case i was over do it be over the top this is negative feedback when a system responds to reverse a change in other words it doesn't increase the thing that's happening um the, the coast respond in this example by um by having a negative um, feedback loop so check your answer, give it a little mark now at this point. If you didn't, um, if you're not sure whether your answer was worthy of four marks, maybe send your answer um, to me on Teams or post it in the um, in the chat um, on the Coast channel or send it to one of your peers or um, what else could you do? You could email it to me, but I want you to get into the habit now that you're in the, your second year of your A-level of being able to assess your own work and deciding whether yours is worthy of the marks. So thinking about the UK, hopefully some of you have been to Cornwall and some of you might have been to Devon and some of you might have been to, to Wales and some of you might have been to, um, I don't know, Walton on the Nays, which is in Essex. Uh, the coastline around the British Isles in particular is exceedingly varied. So we have the rocky, um, Cove coastline of, of Dorset there with the famous Durdle door that you might have been to um this is the over the summer this was the beach that um caused so much controversy apart from Bournemouth beach where lots of people flocked to this beach in the summer obviously they flocked to this beach because they've been stuck in the house for a long time and this is a very beautiful beach so this is Durdle door in Dorset the Gower Peninsula there bottom in Wales is a um, the bit of Wales that sticks out on the other side of the Bristol Channel before you get to Pembrokeshire, and this is obviously a very uh, sandy coastline with very very little rocks as you can see there. It's famous for surfing. It's got some great surfing beaches. Walton on the Nays there, bottom right in Essex, clearly a sandy cliff there which, with a lot of slumping. So that's on the east coast of Britain uh, where the North Sea is quite rough, and you've got there some. Uh, some rocks which have collapsed from the cliff above. You've got terraces there which are um, uh, moving down from the top of the cliff due to weathering processes, which we'll come on to in a later lesson. And then on the top right there, you've got the Moray Coast in Scotland, which is, as you can see there, quite rocky with some um, headlands and bays. So we've got lots of things in the UK. You know, we've got spits, we've got tombolos, we've got coves, we've got headlands, we've got 
uh, stacks, stomps, all those lovely features that you enjoyed so much at GCSE Geography, you'll be able to come back to in this lovely part of the A-level course. So if you have a think about um, the, the reason for this variety in a, a coastal area, especially in the UK, which is sort of where you should be focusing your attention um, in this lesson, you will see that all these factors listed on this slide are the factors that affect coastal areas. So you might be able to think of more, um, more factors. We'll be looking at some of these factors in the coming lessons. So we'll be looking at geological factors in, the, uh, in, in, in lessons three and four. We'll be looking at waves in lesson six, some type of wave and beach geomorphological factors. We'll be looking at storms and things like that when we come on to coastal flooding. And uh, we'll be looking at groundwater when we look at coastal flooding. Human factors we'll look at when we do some case studies about Holderness and other places in the UK. <coughs> and biological factors we'll come on to when we look at weathering and sub-aerial processes. So just uh, you could make a note of, of these factors or you could just take a um, look at these student notes which come with this lesson and you'll probably find that quite a lot of them are on the, the, uh, the, the handout already. The next thing you need to know about the coast is that um, what the littoral zone is. So the littoral zone um, is the zone of any body of water, a lake, a river or the ocean that is near the shore. Basically that's it in a nutshell. But um, to actually define it to get the, I suppose, a, a strict definition is quite difficult. But basically if you want to have something that you could regurgitate in the exam if you need to, you could basically use this definition here in the box. So it's basically the area of the um, of the coast and ocean that extends from high water mark to the continental shelf. So the high water mark to the continental shelf. So the continental shelf, you might be saying, well, I don't know what that is. The continental shelf is the bit of land that's the, how far the land extends basically underneath the ocean before you get to the oceanic plate. So it obviously varies ocean by ocean. You might have a, quite a short continental shelf in some parts of the world. The continental shelf might extend a long way. That's why the definition is quite woolly because it can't be, oh, it's 60 metres offshore to 50 metres onshore because clearly some beaches like, for example, the beaches of Blackpool and um, the coast of Lancashire are exceedingly deep, i.e. Uh, the beaches that extend for four miles. So you can walk four miles from the, from the road basically and you still won't reach the sea. So you've got a very, very long beach. Some beaches, as you know, uh, you'll have been on them yourself, I hope, that where you, you're going to get cut off by the tide because the actual beach zone is so short that if you don't leave the beach, the sea will cover it, basically. So, it, so that's why the littoral zone has that quite, quite woolly um, explanation or definition. And, but you need to be able to define it. So you could pause the video here take a note of the literal zone or refer to the student notes and just highlight that to make sure you understand what it is. The literal zone is always changing. We've talked about the coast being exceedingly dynamic. We already understand that, I hope. And we've got long-term and short-term factors that change the literal zone. So the short-term factors which we'll be looking at in subsequent lessons are wave type, wave energy, tides, the tidal range, whether you get storms, what the weather's like, it, or, um, in, or the climate, um, basically, in that part of the world. And long-term changes, the, the two that you are really expected to consider on the A-level syllabus are changes in sea level, which may be due to climate change. Uh, we'll be looking at past sea level changes that result in features like uh, rears and fjords and um, Dalmatian and half coasts. We'll come on to those. You may remember those from GCSE Geography or you may have seen those already in the textbook. And um, also changes in sea level that are, sub are, are because of climate change. And by climate change, I mean human-induced climate change. So in the past, changes in sea level where you've got the fjords of Norway and the rears um, like, for example, um, Kingsland in Devon, uh, that those are past changes in sea level caused by isostatic readjustment and caused by uh, expansion of the ocean um, post an ice age. So we'll be looking at both of those things, historical change in sea level and what changes in sea level caused essentially by humans. So this uh, little diagram of the littoral zone 
you it would be wise to pause the video here and make sure you understand it and that you can label the zones uh, it might be useful to um, to be able to label the things on the diagram such as the longshore bars troughs wave cut benches beach face etc berm you could take a photograph of it, but you'd have to make sure it would be better to sketch it, basically. Um, check whether um, you can just add annotation to the student notes, because I'm not sure whether this is actually on the student notes. But I, if it is, happy days. If it's not, then um, you could sketch this um, so it's in your notes. You can pause the video and do that now. So in the literal zone, we've talked about the, the fact that it's made up of backshore, foreshore, nearshore and offshore, which is what you sketched on the previous diagram. And at the backshore, um, there it is there between the sort of cliffs and the, the where the high tide reaches to. And then we've got the foreshore exposed at low tide, which is between high tide and low tide. Nearshore, the bit of the ocean, basically, which... Um, uh, which basically extends from the lowest point of low tide to the breaker line, i.e. where the, the waves break from, and then the offshore. So not to be confused with offside or anything like that. And uh, again, these definitions are a bit woolly, and we'll come on to those shortly. So here we are thinking about the um, what might be in the back shore. So we've got, you could either have cliffs, can you, um, and, and a, a beach, or you could have sand dunes. It's not always cliffs, obviously. And then we've got here the foreshore. So on the foreshore between high and low tide, this is uh, an area that's very dynamic because it's constantly attacked by waves and currents, obviously. So you've got constructive and destructive waves here. And um, this is the, so this, this part of the foreshore would be covered at high tide and exposed at low tide. But remember, you can't put a, a, like a length on this. It's not a certain amount of meters because it depends on the beach, it depends on how how steep the beach face is, um, this sort of green section here, depends how steep the beach face is and it depends how uh, what the tidal range is. So it, yeah, all these things depend. Here we're talking about the nearshore and the offshore. So in the nearshore, we've got the, the shallow water between the breaker zone um, and the beach basically. So obviously this, this the, the main thing you need to think about with this is when you're talking about coasts is maybe what the ecology perhaps would be like or what the what sort of um creatures would be in this part of the ocean so basically we'll, we'll come on to that maybe with the impacts of climate change offshore really the zone seaward of nearshore you will have very little um kind of interaction with that in geography a level if you studied oceanography at university then obviously you would get your head all around that so you just need to know the definition of offshore it will not really concern you for a coast um, a level course so uh, that ends the the kind of formal part of this lesson and what you should do now is pause the video and you don't need to write the answers to these questions down but basically pause the video at this point and try and answer these questions. So maybe look at question one, describe the essential features of the backshore, and then flick yourself to the answer on the next, uh, um, on the next slide um, and have a look there. So you could pause the video at this point, have a go at these questions. If you want to do it using the actual PowerPoint, you'll have been provided with a link for that. If you want to use it, just you have a go at these questions using my video then basically just pause the video at this point have a go at all those questions um, and then I will leave the next slide up for a bit longer so if you pause the video and you're looking at your answers just check that your answers to these questions are um, are roughly in lines with the ones here and if you have been able to answer those questions you have successfully got the knowledge that you needed for this lesson so well done. If you are looking at the PowerPoint and you're not looking at this video, you will see there are two in-class activities which follow this. You do not need to do these in-class activities at home. They will be done in the classroom when you come in armed with your knowledge. Right, it's been a pleasure uh, and I will see you next lesson.